around 500 BC, Greece, a rugged land, bore witness to remarkable achievements in the realms of art, philosophy, and warfare. Within its illustrious city-states, Athens, a maritime powerhouse, thrived as a center of democracy. In contrast, Sparta, renowned for its formidable military, embodied a deeply militaristic society. In 480 BC, these two city-states formed a formidable alliance to withstand the mighty Persian Empire's invasion. At the narrow passage of Thermopylae, a small Greek force led by 300 Spartans valiantly held off the massive Persian army for three days, before finally succumbing to encirclement. Later, in the Straits of Salamis, the Greek navy achieved a decisive victory over the Persian fleet. The subsequent year witnessed the Greeks securing a pivotal land victory over the Persians at Platella, forcing the invaders to abandon their campaign. The ensuing five decades marked the golden age of classical Greece. However, mounting tensions between Athens and Sparta, along with their respective allies, ultimately ignited a prolonged conflict, plunging the Greek world into decades of devastating warfare. These intra-Greek conflicts endured for nearly a century, leaving the city-states depleted and vulnerable to the rise of a new power to the north. For centuries, the cultured Greeks had long considered the mountainous kingdom of Macedonia as a distant and uncultured realm, barely qualifying as Greek. Yet under the rule of King Philip II, Macedonia underwent a remarkable transformation into a formidable military force. In 338 BC, at the Battle of Chironia, Philip's army decisively defeated the combined forces of Thebes and Athens. Through a combination of alliances and conquests, Philip had already gained control over most of his neighboring regions. Following this triumph, he unified all of Greece, except Sparta, into a coalition known as the Hellenic League, with Philip as its supreme commander. Philip then embarked on ambitious plans for a pan-Hellenic campaign against the weakened Persian Empire. But tragically, on the eve of launching his grand campaign, Philip fell victim to assassination at the hands of his own bodyguard. His successor would be his son, Alexander III, who was only 20 years of age, being born in Pella, the capital of the Kingdom of Macedon in 356 BC. He was born to Philip's fourth wife, Olympias. In his early years, Alexander was taught by the strict Leonidas, relative of his mother. Alexander was raised in the manner of noble Macedonian use, learning to read, play the lyre, ride, fight, and hunt. When Alexander was 13, Philip began to search for a tutor. He would choose Aristotle and provided the Temple of Nymphus as a classroom. Nymphus was like a boarding school for Alexander and the children of Macedonian nobles. Many of these students would become his friends and future generals. Aristotle taught Alexander and his companions about medicine, philosophy, morals, religion, logic, and art. During his youth, Alexander was also acquainted with Persian exiles at the Macedonian court who received the protection of Philip II as they opposed the Persian king Arxerxes. Alexander's early reign focused on consolidating his power. He executed potential rivals such as his cousin and two Macedonian princes involved in his father's assassination. The news of Philip's death sparked revolts in various states, including Thebes, Athens, Thessaly, and the Thracian tribes. Alexander responded swiftly, amassing troops and subduing Thessaly. He continued south where he was recognized as the leader of the Hellenic League and received the title of Hegemon in Corinth. Alexander would then march north, securing his northern borders by suppressing revolts in Thrace and Illyria, before once again marching south to quell another rebellion in Thebes and Athens. Alexander, upon reaching Thebes, would defeat the garrison and raise the city to the ground, which intimidated Athens into surrender and brought temporary peace to Greece. After securing his hold over the Greek states, Alexander would pick up where his father had left off. He would march through Thrace and begin making preparations for his army to cross the Hellespont into Persian-controlled Anatolia. When Alexander's army crossed the Hellespont, it would number around 40,000 strong. 
and would include 9,000 phalangists under the command of Parmenian, which made up the bulk of the Macedonian army and had been one of the key military reforms under Philip II. These heavily armored infantry were armed with a sarissa, a massive 18 to 20 foot pike. This weapon gave them a significant advantage over the shorter traditional spears used at the time. Each phalangist also carried a smaller double-edged sword and a shield that was designed to be carried by a sling over the shoulder due to the two-handed nature of the sarissa. The key to the phalangist's success was their formation, the phalanx. This close ordered formation allowed for maximum protection, with each phalangist carrying his shield in a way that protected not only himself, but the right side of the soldier next to him. This formation was primarily offensive designed to advance in a unified line into the heart of the enemy forces. The phalanx would have some substantial drawbacks, primarily its limited effectiveness on uneven terrain, which made it hard to maneuver, and the susceptibility of flanking from the enemy formation. So to counter these weaknesses, the Greeks would place Hypaspus on the right of the phalanges, under the command of Parmenian son, Nicanor. The Hypaspis, also known as shield bearers, would number around 3,000. Although not as heavily armored as the Phalangists, they were more mobile, characterized by their distinctive equipment and weaponry. They carried short spears or javelins. Their primary role was to provide support to the Phalangists and to engage in close quarters combat when necessary. Behind the phalanx was positioned around 12,000 Greek and mercenary hoplites taken from across Greece their name came from the hoplon, a large round shield that provided essential protection on the battlefield. The hoplites were generally heavily armored and carried an 8 foot long thrusting spear. The hoplites would also fight in the phalanx. Although not as effective as the Macedonian phalangites, they were well trained and armored for the time. The Agriones would make up the army's elite skirmishers. They were excellent javelin throwers from what's now southern Bulgaria. The army would also include other skirmishers from Thrace and Ilria, armed with javelins, slings, and bows. On both the right and left flanks were positioned cavalry. The cavalry would be utilized as the army's main shock troops, designed to make the decisive breakthrough of the enemy lines. There were two main divisions of cavalry, the companion and the prodromi. The latter was the more flexible and versatile Balkan cavalry which was used primarily as scouts. The Companion Cavalry was a more important division, and was commanded at first by Philotas. They were divided into eight squadrons, each man carrying a nine-foot lance, but wore little armor. Of course, the most important of these squadrons was that of Alexander. Alexander and his royal companions always fought on the right, while Callus commanded the Thessalian Cavalry on the left flank. The tactics remained simple. The Macedonian phalanx would hit the center of the opposing army, while the cavalry would attack and punch holes on the flanks. The army was designed to attack, and when used correctly became a formidable fighting force. While well-trained soldiers are always essential for success, the army's leadership was remarkable. Besides Alexander, the force to cross the Hellespont had many capable officers that would ultimately lead Alexander's army to the edge of the known world. Before Philip had been murdered in 336, he sent Parmenian with an army of around 10,000 men into Anatolia to make preparations for his main invasion. At first, all went well. The Greek cities on the western coast of Anatolia would revolt, but soon the news that Philip had been murdered and had been succeeded by his young son Alexander would demoralize the Greeks who would subsequently be defeated near Magnesia by the Achaemenids under the command of the mercenary Memnon of Rhodes. Two years later, after securing his position in Greece, Alexander was ready to take over Philip's invasion. He marched his army to the Hellespont in early spring 334 BC, where he would make preparations to land in Anatolia 20 days later. Darius would have been informed about Alexander's movements for some time, maybe as early as the invasion force had left Macedon. This did not alarm the great king who left the defense of Asia Minor to his local satraps. 
Since Persian satraps were provincial governors in Achaemenid Persia, they were appointed by the king and had authority over taxation, justice, security, and military affairs in their region. The Persian satraps and commanders in Anatolia would raise their army and encamp near Zelia. The army was most likely led by Arcides, the local satrap. The army also contained the satrap of Lydia, Ionia, and Cilicia, along with several other commanders. A council was held by the Persians to discuss the state of affairs, which would result in the Persian army taking up position on the eastern bank of the Granicus River, where they waited for Alexander's attack. When Alexander arrived at the river, the Persian army would number around 40,000 strong, roughly 10 to 20,000 cavalry, and roughly the same amount of infantry. The infantry would be made up of mostly Greek mercenaries, who would be placed at the back of the formation, probably because the Persians did not trust them in battle against fellow Greeks. This is probably why the Persian force chose to defend a river crossing, and why the Persians stationed their cavalry in front along the bank of the Granicus. After both armies finished their deployment, there was a moment of silence. Alexander then ordered Amintas with a squadron of companion cavalry to charge the Persian left flank, followed by the Paeonian cavalry, the Prodromi, and an infantry unit. The Persians would answer the charge by launching a volley of javelins. Amintas's force was at a disadvantage as they were severely outnumbered, and the Persians were defending higher ground at the top of the bank. The Macedonians suffered losses and were forced to retreat back towards Alexander, who is now advancing with the remainder of the right wing in the infantry. Whether the attack led by Amintas was a failure or simply just a ruse, it drew the Persian cavalry out of formation as they pursued the retreating force of Amintas into the riverbed. The disruption of the Persian formation made them vulnerable to a second attack which after being joined by Amintas' force, slammed into the Persian force. Alexander and his men engaged the Persians and their leaders in a hard-fought battle. During the battle, Alexander was struck in the head by Roasasis, but the helmet protected him, and Alexander cut him down by thrusting him in the chest with his lance. From behind, Spithridides raised his sword to attack Alexander, but Clytus the Black anticipated this blow, and cut off his arm, sword and all. The Macedonian cavalry eventually got the upper hand and established a foothold on the riverbank, allowing the infantry to reinforce Alexander's cavalry. At this point in the battle, the Macedonian cavalry and the light infantry were interspread. Together they forced back the Persian cavalry. This began on the Persian left flank where Alexander was fighting. Then the center was broken and the Persian cavalry on both wings fled. Alexander did not pursue them far, but turned his attention to the Greek mercenaries, who had mostly remained inactive at their original position. The mercenaries, surprised by the turn of events, were quickly attacked by both the foot companions from the front and the cavalry from all other directions. They were soon surrounded and massacred, and only a few were able to escape. Following Alexander's victory, the Persians would surrender the provincial capital and the treasury of Sardis, giving Alexander control over much of Hellespontine Phrygia. Alexander would then proceed along the Ionian coast, liberating cities from Persian control. Alexander would soon come upon the coastal cities of Miletus and Holoconarsus, which both housed parts of the much superior Persian fleet which threatened his communication back to Greece. Nicanor, Parmenion's son, would soon begin the delicate siege of Miletus. While further south at Holoconarsus, Alexander waged his first full-scale siege, eventually forcing his opponents, the mercenary captain Memnon of Rhodes and the Persian satrap of Caria to withdraw by sea. And by the winter of 334, both cities had fallen. The force from Holoconarsus under the command of Memnon of Rhodes 
will begin a campaign to capture the Aegean Islands using the Persian fleet. Memnon managed to capture the islands of Chios and most of Lesbos, but luckily for Alexander, Memnon died shortly after, ending his campaign. From Holoconarsis, Alexander proceeded into the mountainous Lycinian plain, asserting control over the coastal cities, attempting to deny the Persians naval bases in the Mediterranean. From Pamphylia onwards, the coast held no major ports, and Alexander moved inland. At the ancient Phrygian capital of Gordium, Alexander undid the unsolvable Gordian knot by hacking it apart with his sword, a feat said to await the future king of Asia. In spring 333 BC, Alexander crossed the Taurus into Cilicia. After a long pause due to an illness, he marched on towards Syria. Though the emergence of Darius's significantly larger army was unbeknownst to him, until it was too late. Alexander would attempt to march back to Cilicia, but he had been outmaneuvered and would be forced to fight Darius at the Battle of Issus. The vastly superior Persian army would number a some hundred thousand compared to the Greeks' 40,000 men. Though the terrain would prevent Darius from exploiting his superiority, as the distance from the surrounding mountains to the water was no more than two miles. Alexander led his companion cavalry on the right flank, and he set his Thessalian cavalry on the left flank of the phalanx with Parmenian in command. Darius formed his line with his heavy cavalry concentrated next to the coast, where the ground was best for cavalry. Followed by the Greek mercenary phalanx, and on his left, Darius spread his Persian infantry. The superior elite Persian cavalry charged Parmenian on the left flank, crossing the river to open the battle. Following this, the Macedonian phalanx began its advance across the river and up the fortified bank into the waiting arms of the Greek mercenaries waiting for them on the other side. On the left flank, the Thessalian cavalry was struggling, fighting against the superior mass of Persian heavy horses that delivered charge after charge. Alexander, realizing action needed to be made, personally led his Ipaspis on foot against the Persian left flank, delivering a decisive blow, managing to punch a hole through the Persian line. Alexander then mounted his horse and led his companion cavalry in a direct assault against Darius and his bodyguards, causing them to flee the battlefield. However, Alexander, realizing the dire state of his left flank and center, allowed Darius to flee and regrouped his cavalry before crashing into the rear of the Greek mercenaries. Once the Persians realized the dire state of the battle and that their great king had retreated, they abandoned their positions and fled in full rout. The Hellenic cavalry pursued the fleeing Persians for as long as there was light, inflicting significant carnage after the battle. Ptolemy mentions that while pursuing Darius, Alexander and his bodyguards came upon a ravine which they easily crossed on the piled up bodies of dead Persians. The victory for Alexander was decisive. In Darius's haste, he had left behind his wife, his two daughters, his mother, and part of his treasury, which was all captured by Alexander. Darius offered a peace treaty that included the lands he had already lost and a ransom of 10,000 talents for his family. Alexander replied that since he was now king of Asia, it was he alone who would decide territorial divisions. Alexander proceeded to march down the coast, taking possession of Syria and most of the coast of the Levant. In the following year, 332 BC, he attacked Tyre, a well-fortified island city off the coast. Alexander would build a land bridge stretching out to the island, and after the arrival of his newly captured Persian navy, him and his troops would make landfall and easily overpower the garrison, ending the long and difficult siege. The citizens who took shelter in the temple were pardoned by Alexander, including the king of Tyre. The remaining inhabitants, some 30,000 people, were killed or sold into slavery. 
when the news of Alexander's capture and subsequent destruction of Tyre spread, most of the towns on the route to Egypt quickly capitulated. Until Alexander met the stronghold of Gaza, the last thing between him and Egypt. The stronghold was heavily fortified and built on a hill. When his engineers pointed out to him that because of the height of the mound it would be impossible, this encouraged Alexander all the more to make an attempt. After three unsuccessful assaults, the stronghold finally fell, as entire men of military age were put to the sword and women and children were sold into slavery. Alexander now entered the vast Egyptian delta, arriving at Pelusium, where the Persian governor of Egypt would surrender the entire province to the Greeks. At Memphis, the people welcomed him as a liberator and crowned him pharaoh. At the mouth of the Nile, Alexander would found the city of Alexandria. He then traveled to Siwa, where the priests welcomed him and proclaimed him son of Amun king of the gods. Leaving Egypt in 331 BC, Alexander marched eastward into Achaemenid Assyria in Upper Mesopotamia, where he would receive another offer from Darius, offering him all of the territory west of the Euphrates, co-rulership of the Achaemenid Empire, and the hand of one of his daughters in 30,000 talents of silver. In the account of Diodorus, Alexander explicitly deliberated this offer with his friends. Alexander in the end refused the offer of Darius and insisted that there could only be one king of Asia. Once Alexander received word Darius had gathered another army and was waiting for him at Gagamela, Alexander would march right for him, determined to crush him once and for all. When Alexander arrived, the Persians had already been present on the battlefield for days. They had deployed scythe chariots, for which Darius had ordered the land flattened and bushes and vegetation removed from the battlefield to maximize their effectiveness. The Macedonians were also decisively outnumbered, maybe as much as two to one. Darius placed himself in the center with his best infantry. On both flanks were the cavalry chariots were placed in front. While the Macedonians formed up normally, the right side under the direct command of Alexander and the left under Parmenion. Alexander began by ordering his infantry to march in phalanx formation towards the center of the enemy line. The Macedonians advanced with the wings eclonged back at 45 degrees to lure the Persian cavalry to attack. Meanwhile, Alexander began moving his companion cavalry to the right and around the Persian left flank. In response, Darius moved the cavalry from his center and left to attack Alexander, while also moving his right flank to attack the Greek left. Darius now launched his chariots at Alexander's army. Many of the chariots were intercepted by the Agriones and other javelin throwers. The chariots who made it through the barrage of javelins charged the Macedonian lines, which responded by opening up their ranks, creating alleys through which the chariots passed harmlessly. As the Persians advanced further and further on the Greek flanks in their attack, Alexander disengaged his companions, prepared for the decisive attack. He formed his units into a giant wedge, with him leading the charge. This large wedge then smashed into the weakened Persian center, taking Darius's royal guard and the Greek mercenaries. Darius, in danger of being cut off, now broke and ran, with the rest of his center following him. Alexander could have pursued Darius at this point, however he received desperate messages from Parmenion on the left flank. Parmenion's wing was encircled by the cavalry of the Persian right wing, Alexander was forced to give up his pursuit of Darius and help Parmenion. What happened next was described by Arian as the fiercest engagement of the battle, as Alexander and his companions encountered the cavalry of the Persian right, eventually breaking them, however not without losses. Alexander then began in advance to Babylon, where he was recognized as King of Kings, before continuing on to Susa 
He then sent the bulk of his army to the Persian ceremonial capital of Persepolis via the Persian royal road. Alexander himself took selected troops on the direct route to the city. He then stormed the pass of the Persian gates, which had been blocked by the Persian army. On entering Persepolis, Alexander allowed his troops to loot the city for days. Alexander stayed in Persepolis for five months. During his stay, a fire broke out in the eastern palace of Xerxes I and spread to the rest of the city. Alexander then marched on Ecbana and chased Darius, first into Media and then Parthia, though the Persian king no longer controlled his own destiny. As he was taken prisoner by Bessus, his Bactrian satrap. As Alexander approached, Bessus killed the great king and then declared himself Darius' successor before retreating into Central Asia to launch a guerrilla campaign against Alexander. Alexander would bury Darius' remains next to his Achaemenid predecessors in a regal funeral. The Achaemenid Empire is normally considered to have fallen with Darius. After Darius' death, the Persian Empire collapsed, the last remnants trying to be pulled together by the usurper Bessus, who was fleeing from Alexander. On the march towards Bactria, a plot against his life was revealed. One of his officers, Philotas, failed to alert Alexander, an action which he would be executed for. The death of Philotas necessitated the death of his father, Parmenion, who had been charged with guarding the treasury at Ecbatana and was assassinated at Alexander's command. This campaign, initially against Bessus, turned into a grand tour of Central Asia. Alexander founded a series of new cities, all called Alexandria. In 329 BC, Bessus was betrayed to Ptolemy. Bessus was then flogged and executed by order of Alexander. Alexander subsequently subjugated Sogdia, winning several battles against various peoples. At the Jaxartes River, he fought the Saka, a nomadic people that had raided the region for years. The Saka occupied the northern bank of the Jaxartes, confident that they could beat Alexander's men if they attempted to cross. But the Greeks, using powerful catapults and siege bows, were able to force the Saka from the banks making it easy for the Macedonians to cross the Jaxartes. In all likelihood, the Saka would normally have withdrawn at this point. However, Alexander wanted to neutralize the threat to his borders and was not about to let the enemy get away. He ordered a battalion of mounted spearmen to advance and provoke an attack. The nomads, not recognizing this move for what it was, immediately attacked Alexander's vanguard. Once the horse archers were engaged, they were vulnerable to an approach by the Macedonian infantry. The nomads had trapped themselves in between Alexander's army. The Saka tried to escape to the wings of the Macedonian lines, but were ultimately trapped, inflicting a crippling defeat, allowing Alexander to finally head south. At Maracata, Alexander accidentally killed Clytus the Black during a violent drunken altercation. Clytus being the man who had saved his life at the Granicus six years earlier. He would marry Roxana in 327 BC, which helped cement his relations with his new Central Asian satraps. During this time, Alexander adopted some elements of Persian dress and customs at his court. This was one aspect of Alexander's broad strategy, aimed at securing the aid and support of the Persian upper class. The Greeks, however, viewed this as an abandonment of Greek culture and led to resentment among his army. Alexander then began his march towards India. While on the march, Alexander sent ambassadors ahead to the various tribes of the former satrap of Gandhar, asking them to come to him and submit to his authority. Taxila and a number of other princes came to him, bringing gifts and paying tribute to the Macedonians. At the end of spring 327 BC, Alexander began his campaign into the Kofan Valley. 
he would win several decisive victories, subjugating the Aspasians, which secured his supply line, which had previously been stretched. At Aragaeum, Alexander would face the king of the Gurians, who had assembled a larger force than that of the Macedonians. Alexander divided his army into three parts, with Ptolemy taking up the left, Leonatus was ordered to take up the right flank, and Alexander took up the center, opposed to the Gurians. Alexander sent Ptolemy and Leonatus to their respective flanks by routes that the Gurians could not observe, thus hiding the flanks of his army from the Gurians. Alexander's contingent was comparatively small, and his plan was to lure them out and to fight them while Leonatus and Ptolemy took their flanks and encircled them. As expected, the Gurians attacked Alexander's small contingent in the center. When the time was right, Ptolemy and Leonatus launched the ambush. They faced rough fighting but were both able to achieve a decisive victory. Once the Gurians realized the dire state of the battle, they surrendered. The Macedonians captured roughly 40,000 Gurians. Continuing along, Alexander defeated the Assanians at the sieges of Masaga, Aornis, and Nysa, successfully subjugating the Kofan Valley. He would then cross the Indus to begin campaigning in the Punjab region. In the spring of 326 BC, Alexander arrived on the north banks of the Hydaspes River, and the king of the Paravas, Porus, drew up on the south bank in an attempt to repeal any crossing by Alexander. The Hydaspes River was deep and fast moving. Alexander knew that a direct approach had little chance of success and tried to find alternative fords. Eventually, Alexander found and used a suitable crossing about 17 miles or 27 kilometers upstream from his camp. He left his general Craterus behind with most of the army to make sure Porus would not find out about his plan. Under the cover of darkness, Alexander quietly moved his part of the army upstream, then traversed the river in utmost secrecy. Once Porus got wind of his opponent's maneuver, he sent a small cavalry and chariot force under his son, hoping that he would be able to prevent the crossing. Though Alexander had already crossed, and was advancing towards the location of Porus's camp, with all his horsemen and archers, leaving his phalanx to follow up behind. Upon meeting with young Porus's force, his horse archers showered the enemy with arrows, while his heavy cavalry immediately charged. The suddenness had left the Indian chariots useless as they become immobilized in the mud near the shore of the river. His small force was completely routed. As news reached the king, he understood that Alexander had crossed to his side of the river and turned to face him with the best part of his army, leaving behind a small contingent to disrupt the landing of Craterus's force. Eventually, the two forces met and arrayed themselves for battle. The Indians were poised with cavalry on both flanks, while their center comprised of infantry with war elephants stationed in front of them. Porus himself fighting atop his tallest elephant. Alexander, noticing that Porus's position was strongest in the center, decided to attack first with his cavalry on the flanks, setting his horse archers to harass the Indian left wing. His companion cavalry then attacked the outnumbered Indian cavalry, with Alexander himself leading the charge. The rest of the Indian cavalry moved to the aid of their hard-pressed kinsmen, Baconus' squadron promptly followed their movement and attacked them from the rear, encircling the Indian horsemen, which were subsequently routed and fled to the safety of their elephants. The war elephants now came into conflict with the Macedonian phalanx. The powerful beasts caused heavy losses among the Macedonian foot, trampling and disorganizing their dense lines. Nevertheless, the Macedonian infantry resisted the attack with light infantry tossing javelins at the elephant's eyes and the riders on their back, while the heavy infantry struck at their legs with two-sided axes and swords. The elephants were eventually repulsed and fled back through their own lines. 
The maddened animals wreaked havoc, trampling many of their own infantry and cavalry. Finally, the Macedonian phalanx locked their shield in advance upon the confused enemy mass, while the Macedonian cavalry charged from the rear, putting the entire Indian army to rout. Meanwhile, Craterus and his force had succeeded in crossing the river, and arriving just at the right moment to conduct a thorough pursuit on the fleeing Indians. Throughout the battle, Alexander observed with growing admiration the valor of Porus. Hoping to save the life of such a competent leader and warrior, Alexander offered him surrender, allowing him to retain his lands. Following the battle, Alexander founded two cities, called Alexandria Bucephalus and Alexandria Nicaea, the latter the site of the battle and named after the Greek word for victory, and the former on the opposite side of the bank to honor his horse Bucephalus, who fell during the battle. East of Porus' kingdom, near the Ganges River, was the powerful Nanda Empire. Fearing the prospects of facing other powerful Indian armies, and exhausted by years of campaigning, his army mutinied refusing to march further east. Alexander, using the maps of the Greeks, thought that the world ended a mere thousand kilometers away at the edge of India. He therefore spoke to his army and tried to persuade them to march further. But Alexander, seeing the unwillingness of his men, agreed and turned back. Alexander commissioned a fleet to explore the Persian Gulf under his admiral Nearchus. Alexander then sent some of his forces back with Craterus, taking a northern route, while he led the rest of his forces back to Persia by the southern route through the Gadosian Desert. In the desert crossing, Alexander's army took enormous casualties from both hunger and thirst. Discovering that many of his satraps and military governors had misbehaved in his absence, Alexander executed several of them as examples on his way to Susa. As a gesture of thanks, he paid off the debts of his soldiers, announced that he would send over-aged and disabled veterans back to Macedon, led by Craterus. His troops misunderstood his intention and mutinied at the town of Opus. He refused to be sent away and criticized his adoption of Persian customs, dress, and the introduction of Persian officers and soldiers into Macedonian units. After three days, unable to persuade his men to back down, Alexander reconciled. The Macedonians quickly begged forgiveness, which Alexander accepted, and held a banquet with several thousand of his men in an attempt to craft the lasting harmony between his Macedonian and Persian subjects. Alexander also held a mass marriage of his senior officers to Persian and other noble women at Susa. Afterwards, Alexander traveled to Ecbatana to retrieve the bulk of the Persian treasury. There, his closest friend Hephaestan died of illness. Hephaestan's death devastated Alexander. He ordered the preparation of a funeral in Babylon, along with a decree for public mourning. On the evening of May 29th, Alexander organized a banquet for his army to celebrate the end of the campaign of India and the onset of the invasion of the Arabian Peninsula. But shortly after, Alexander developed a fever, which worsened until he was unable to speak. On June 11, 323 BC, Alexander died in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar II in Babylon at age just 32. Alexander's death was so sudden that when reports of his death reached Greece, they were not immediately believed. Alexander had no obvious or legitimate heir, his son Alexander IV by Roxanne being born after Alexander's death. After the assassination of Perdiccas in 321 BC, Macedonian unity collapsed, and 40 years of war between the successors ensued. In the process, both Alexander IV and Philip III were murdered. Never has one man had such an impact on history. In just 12 years, he had conquered one of the largest empires in human history. 
stretching from Greece to India, a feat which would forever immortalize him in the West as Alexander the Great.